All right, guys, what is up? Back for a Playing to Win episode uh, number 71 with my uh, good friend Jack Donovan. How you doing, brother? I'm doing all right. It's been a while, man. It's been a while. Um, you are one of the top dog authors that I've been recommended to my audience, my community for years now. I've got some huge fans in my group that have read pretty much all your books now. So um, I'm a big fan. I think I got uh, at least two or three of them just on my shelf down over there. Haven't gotten your new one yet. Um, I describe you a, a ton of different ways, and I know that you're constantly evolving as a man. How do you how do you give guys the elevator pitch on who Jack Donovan is today? Well, I guess I, I, I probably would have resisted it first, but I, I'm kind of just a philosopher, I think, for regular guys at this point. Because a lot of a lot of you guys, uh, you know, you tell them how to get laid or to to make money, and I I'm bad at both of those things. So like, uh, you know, I, I talk more about how to think about life, I think in a big picture and think about, uh, now I talk more, a lot about more mythology and so forth, but, uh, I guess my claim to fame is that, you know, I wrote the way of men and I did a really good job of defining masculinity, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is important. It wasn't as important in 2012 as it seems today when people can't even define what a man and a woman are. Yeah. Uh, so I think that it was, it's important. It's kind of foundational for a lot of other and authors and so forth. So that, that was my big piece of the puzzle, I think. And what brought you to to that book, to writing that book, The Way of Men? Well, I mean, like a lot of people, I you know, thought that you know, masculinity was maybe not so important, like as we're told, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you know, masculinity was not so important, that it was outdated and whatever. And I, you know, I probably, as a young man, I probably believed a lot of that. And then I started to explore it as an, as an, you know, in my 30s. And uh, think about, but you know, because I lived life and worked at jobs and so forth, and I'm like, the world isn't the way they say it is. And uh, so I started talking really positive about positively about masculinity. And the thing is, is that uh, my some of the early criticisms I got was that I wasn't defining it very well. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way of men was my attempt to define it as well as I could. Do you think women can tell men how to be men? There's a there's a very loud group of. Uh... I don't know, influencers, media personalities, and all sort of thing that are, that are constantly trying to tell men how to be men and what a man really is. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, yeah, women have no business in that discussion whatsoever. Men have always defined masculinity for each other, whether it's in a, a group or you know in a larger society. Uh, you know, men get to say what masculinity is. Uh, you know, if you want women to be able to say what femininity is, mas men have to say what masculinity is. And, and honestly, you know, there's a separate set of interests there, obviously. Uh, you know, when women define masculinity, it's whatever women want it to be. It's not uh, what men need or what men, you know, know about themselves. Mm -hmm. It's just what women want a man to be. And that could be anything from, you know, you know shut up and do what I say to, uh, you know, to the ones who want them to be the strong alpha guy or whatever, but uh, it's it's really about what they want for men, not uh, what men are. Yeah, that's um, that's become painfully obvious because I mean, if you deal with a twenty year old chick, her definition of masculinity is different from a forty year old chick that's got three kids in tow and divorce, right? You know what what she's going to define is going to be the reliable guy with a minivan and a good steady job and you know blah blah blah. Whereas the twenty year old is like. Can we go to Ibiza this weekend on your private jet and party? You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, the The book became a hit. Have you figured out why? Like, is there like a secret sauce to why that book became such a big hit with the uh, guys out there? Well, I think it was the right book at the right time, and it was written. I think there's there are a lot of books about masculinity, and I still feel like I have a lock on this uh, to a certain degree because we're seeing this again now is that when men talk about masculinity, they talk about it in a tribal way, which is what men do. Uh, but they, you know, want to spin it in their own direction. You know, like the religious guys want to make masculinity all about Jesus or whatever. And then there's mm -hmm. other guys who want to make it about what, whatever they're about. Mm -hmm. And I really just tried to do my best. Like masculinity isn't about, I'm not the exemplar of what masculinity is. I just want to understand what it is. And Got so it. for all the different guys who are in different walks of life, I mean, I have special forces guys and guys who are like, day one week one uh maybe i should you know do something masculine you know like i have the whole gambit because they can all relate to that mm -hmm. 
I think the strongest soundbite that stood out for me in the book was the way of men is the way of way of the gang. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, again, it comes to masculinity being defined by other men. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the big innovations about the, the way of men is I looked at about like men select each other. When you hear, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, uh, evolutionary psychologists and so forth, they talk about masculinity. And a lot of times they were talking about it as if we were like two elks fighting for females or something like that. And that's not really, men are social animals. And, uh, you know, to really be, you know, to understand who you are as a man, you're in a group of other men. And that's our whole evolutionary history is like groups of men have to go hunt together. They have to go fight together. They have to rely on each other. So they select each other. I mean, the easy way to you know, talk about a football team or whatever, but yeah. men select each other. Uh, and uh, from that selection is what women get to choose from. So, you know, it's like if men prove themselves to each other, they're already high status men and then women can select from that. Uh, but I, I think that this idea that this gang is what actually defines masculinity. And I was being provocative, obviously, like with, mm -hmm. with using the word gang. Uh, but I mean, that's really what it is. It's a group of, of men who all share the same values and they're all going to judge each other. And, uh, you know, becoming a man it means being accepted by that group of men, whoever it is. Yeah, I've always said that men compete and women choose, and I think it's a lost art. And men have forgotten that they have to compete and, you know, hold each other accountable. Um the way you talk about gangs, and the last time that I saw you was years ago now in real life, mm -hmm. and I think you were still in Oregon, and you had that plot of land uh, that I believe you right. called Wild Gang, um, and you basically had a, a, a tribe of men, and you you know would get together on weekends and do shit and build buildings and compete and mm -hmm. fight and box and stuff like that. I mean, like your Instagram timeline was filled with that for a while. Then you moved to Utah. Now you're in Arizona. Do you set mm -hmm. up a, uh, a chapter, a tribe, a gang? I mean, do you aim to build that in every area that you move to? Well, I mean, at the time I was part of actually a larger group. And because I didn't think that I could start it by myself. I was just beginning. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's always hard to start the cool kids club until you already have the cool kids club. You know, that's right. kind of how, how it works. Uh, so, you know, I joined another group, which that didn't work out eventually for a lot of reasons. And then, um, you know, I, then I kept the land cause it was mine and, uh, had another group of people who, you know, kept coming out. And now actually the guy who was kind of helping me, uh, he, uh, he actually bought the land from me and he has his own group. So he's still running Vald gang. And I still, I was joking with him this morning. Uh, he's still a really good friend of mine. And a lot of those guys that go out there now are, um, Utah would have been a hard place to do that, I think, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, here, I moved here specifically because I have a, a, I mean, I looked at many places, but I moved to Arizona and where I moved to in Arizona, I moved because I have a jujitsu coach uh, who has been a friend and reader of mine for many years. And uh, I was like, well, in real life, I mean, I'm an author. I, you know, I, I, I cannot talk to anyone for days. Uh, so I want to be, you know, that's where I'm going to meet other guys to hang out with. Is, mm -hmm. is in jiu-jitsu. That's where I go interact with people because otherwise I could sit in my house and never talk to anybody. Uh, so I'm like, I'm going to situate myself near that gym. And it's been really cool. It's like, it's been cool to like get to know him a little bit better. We've already uh, hung out a little bit and, uh, you know, he has, he has a great school going. And so, you know, that's where I get to meet people. Uh, whether or not I want to start a group, the thing is when you start a group and give it a name, then it becomes a target. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have learned that lesson. And uh, because of being a kind of a high profile figure in that particular way, uh, I'm very wary of of that because then you're also responsible for all the other people in that group. I, but uh, men who don't aren't high profile in that way, you know, and you see this all, all around the world, like men are creating groups of men, which is fantastic and exactly what they should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got one. So um, when it comes down to the whole targeting thing, because I find that interesting. Um, mm -hmm. uh, actually, let me circle back to that because I got a, a couple questions here from my boy Moff. He's, he's kind of like one of your big uh, fans. He's a recovering toxic masculinity believer. He asked, he asked Dan over here, uh, does violence still have a place in modern tribes as a means of settling disputes? You know, funny, we were having this conversation. I have this telegram chat with just a few guys who've been like, I've been in contact with for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about this the other day. And, uh, you know, it's funny, it's kind of like debate. In the way that debate doesn't actually reveal truth, it reveals debating skill. You know, like you can be really good at debating and be wrong, but like you're going to sound like you're right. And the same thing is true of, you know, fighting. It's like really a test of fighting skills. It's not a test of right and wrong, unless you're like, believe that like God chooses the right person to win, which is a little ridiculous. Um, so 
I think it has a play in terms of um, certain kinds of guys need to work things out in that particular way. Um, usually when you get guys in their thirties and forties, they don't need to like, you know, fight it out. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they can have a discussion, but you know, there are some younger guys who have to fight, who have to like fight their way through things, uh, with other guys. And, you know, sometimes that's good. And sometimes that's bad. And I don't, uh, I don't really think it's necessary all the time, but you know, uh, sometimes guys have to do that. Yeah. Um, back to the like tribes, like the groups of men, like the whole masculinity, mm -hmm you know, sort of thing. And you were talking about being, you know, being targeted and they do do that. I mean, they will, uh, anytime you sort of step out of the matrix and you, you know, and you unplug from the bullshit they're you know, they want to suck you back in. It's like, no, you must comply. You must continue to be, be drunk on our Kool-Aid. You can't think it independently and do your own thing, you know, sort of thing. Um, do you just stay away from creating a public tribe and sort of keep it in underground? I mean, there's some very public ones out there. There's, there's some kinds that are like definitely under the radar that you wouldn't know about unless somebody knew somebody and they would be offered like an open invite sort of thing. Like what's your right. view on that today? Uh, I mean, for me personally, it's also, you know, I have to figure out who I'm going to attract and whatever. And, and, uh, you know, I've had some bad experiences with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not saying never, I may do it at some point. I just, for a while, I was a little too nuclear and I was like, uh, you know, it just became a thing. Well, anyone who's willing to, you know, possibly have their business sacrificed or whatever is probably not who I want to hang out with. You know, mm -hmm. I want to hang out with guys who are equally successful uh, or can, who I can learn things from. And I want to, I just, I don't want to have a, a group of just like kind of, you know, worshipers and, and uh, sycophants and so forth. Uh, yeah. So for me personally, I, I, you know, I, I, I thought because I was a lightning rod for criticism, um, I, I didn't think that that was really going to be a good move, which is a shame because, you know, Boy Scouts all want the badge. You know, everybody wants to like be part of the Warriors Club and put the badge yeah. on and wear the, wear the outfit. Yeah, I mean, I men are Scouts. wired for that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when you do that, then you know, obviously you're putting that target on your back. Uh, so it's something to be aware of, but yeah, there are lots of other groups. I mean, like whether they're online or, or whatever that, uh, men are a part of, and they are a lot more under the radar. Um, but you know, if I, you know, put out a press release, I am starting a group today. Then like all the people who have been watching me for years would be like, Oh, good. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> <it's> just, <laughs> Jack starting a group. I mean, Antifa will be on that like the next day, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I just have to war, watch that kind of stuff because and dudes, I would, like I said, dudes I would want to hang out with don't want that kind of hassle. Yeah, no, I um, yeah, I agree, man. I've seen you, I've seen you attacked by every different vector over the years, and I think it's hilarious because um, you know, having known you and spoken to you so many times, I it, like it couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, um, I'm a pretty reasonable guy. <laughs> yeah, and fucking hilarious yeah. too, actually. Um, there's. Um, what was I going to say here? <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was, I was, I was thinking about some of the conversations. Um, there, let's let's jump into the sequence of books that you have over here because, it, like, was Way of Men the first one that was printed? Because there was uh, Sky Without Eagles, I think. Um, there's a few others. Like, what was the sequence in which yeah. you would recommend people read these books? The sequence that I recommend, um, I had a couple other books out first, but they are, they're not out anymore. Um, Way of Men is foundational. All of my other work is kind of based on that and I think has the broadest appeal. Uh, Way of Men is what pays my rent. Uh, you know, it, it has the broadest appeal uh, and can connect with all kinds of men. This guy Without Eagles is just an essay collection. I'll probably pull that out of print at some point and mm -hmm. put out a new one. And uh, then, you know, from there, it goes to Becoming a Barbarian, which is more about uh, kind of criticisms of the modern world and men's own relationship to the idea of being in tribes, because we're all kind of very individualistic. I mean, mm -hmm. I certainly am. And then, uh, you know, A More Complete Beast is kind of a summary, and it talks about Nietzsche and resentment. And uh, it has some really good quotes. A lot of the guys really, they're like, More Complete Beast. And I was like, really? That one? That's the one? You're All right, cool. You know, there's a lot of good stuff in there mm -hmm. uh, because it's really boiled down. And then uh, my most recent book, Fire in the Dark, um, really goes back to the way of men, but talks about it in a more spiritual way, like how how do men create ideals and the importance of creating ideals and how ideals kind of become gods. And, um, you know, my version of King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, because that was written by, you know, feminist pacifists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, their, their, their idea of what a warrior is is a little off. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a bad book, but, you know, I think 
you know, mine is better. As I actually, uh, you know, I've had a couple, I've actually rolled with a lot of guys who are big fans of yours. Uh, I had a, you know, like uh, last night at Jiu Jitsu, I had a, a guy who was like, yo, you're going on Richard Cooper's podcast. Awesome. You know? And so I, we bump, I bump into your fans all the time. Yeah, it's cool. Well, there's definitely a, you know, there's an alignment there. Um, you wrote a, a blog post or an essay called I Don't Care at one point. Um, yeah. You know, to the point earlier about, you know, all the attack vectors and people trying to mess with you sort of thing. And mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know when I came across that. It must have been five or six years ago, you know, something like that. And I've often been, you know, recommended to people. And I think I even covered that entire essay in one of my Before the Train Wreck podcasts a couple of years ago. Um, it's profound. Can you can you explain the basis of I don't care? Well, it's kind of it's related to my book, Becoming a Barbarian, to a certain extent. Uh there's this idea that we're supposed to care about literally everything that happens everywhere, which isn't actually true. We're supposed to care about whatever the media tells us to care about on a particular day. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's kind of how we're being controlled. It's like, you know, let's talk about the issue of the day. What are we mad at today? And, uh, you know, it's so tiresome uh, to have that conversation every day because someone's calling that tune. And there's this idea that you're supposed to care about all these people who you don't know and be deeply emotionally affected by it, you know? And uh, the reality is we don't. And so it's very performative for a lot of people. A lot of people are like, oh, I feel so bad for those people. Like, do you really though? You know, like, like you don't know them. Like, you know, obviously there are people who I care about and if something bad happened to them, I would really care. Uh, but I, you really can't care about everybody in the world and what their opinion is. And, uh, you know, like uh, so many times in the online and so forth we deal with like, I'm offended by that. And I'm supposed to care that you're offended by that. Well, yeah. I don't I'm like, why, why would I care about your opinion? You know, it's like, if I don't know you and you know, so often it's like you, you look at the per, then you, you know, the picture and you know what, what they say now, like physiognomy or whatever, like rules, everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, like you see the person and you're like, well, would you listen to that person in a bar or like any other you know venue? And the answer is usually no, you wouldn't get that person at the time of day. So why do you care that they're offended or upset? Mm -hmm. Like uh, you don't respect that person's opinion. And so I, you know, I really don't respect everyone's opinion. And I don't think most of us really do. I'm just being honest about it, I think. And uh, I think that gave, that essay gave a lot of people uh, permission <laughs> to say, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't care though. Uh, I don't care yeah. what you say. And uh, it's, I think there was a story recently about some, uh, uh, some guy who kind of came off as a chat or whatever, who, uh, you know, they, they were interviewing him and they asked about his opinion about uh, the abortion issue or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and he was like, I don't know anything about that. I'm going to the beach, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a very, uh, yeah, it, yeah it, there are a lot of guys like that in the world. And I think that that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, Google it. If you haven't read it, just search for Jack Donovan and then I don't care after that. And you'll find it. It's, it's a, uh, it's a great piece. I mean, you know, you can use it for dealing with the way the world is today or if somebody's bothering you or, you know, trying to make their problem, your problem There's any number of ways that you can unpack the way that that's written, but it's just a, it's such a great essay. It's a 10 out of 10, like Moff just said in the comments. Um, let me grab this uh, super chat here real quick. Small Grace says, uh, plus trying to care about everyone cheapens the care for the ones you deem worthy of your care. Yeah. I, I, I wrote a chapter in my book called um, Managing Your Fs, um, and um, I see it as a limited resource. I mean, you only have so much energy in the day to, you know, to dispense for things that matter. So why would you dispense it on things that don't matter or don't have an ROI or don't improve your life or don't you know, connect you with better people and all that sort of stuff? It's like people are constantly trying to steal your attention and your time with their bullshit, with you know, manufactured indignation in the media about some fucking disease that kills almost nobody or some something that's happening in a part of the world that, you know, it's going to have no bearing on you whatsoever. Right. 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 Yeah. They're always trying to suck you into these narratives, but, it, but it's like, you know, um, actually that, that kind of brings me to the idea of perimeters. Cause I think in one of your books, you, you talk about drawing a perimeter, you know, like, and defining us versus them. And, um, you know, I do that with different levels of perimeters. Like I might have a perimeter, you know, amongst the five people, you know, that are closest to me, like my family, you know, the people that I love, my kid, you know, you know, sort of thing. Then you've got your friends and you've got your community, then you've got, you know, sort of thing. And it's like a concentric set of rings that, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of go out in a, a tree. And the further the rings out, the fewer fucks you give on what happens, you know, like in that ring. And the definition of us versus them is obviously more us here and more them, you know, further out. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about that perimeter and the thinking, you know, behind that and why you talked about that in your book? Well, I think it's foundational to what men do in the world. Uh, fundamentally, I mean, and this is, I went back into this again, it started in the way of men. There's a chapter called the perimeter. And then, uh, you know, I, I revisited that in fire in the dark recently because it has to do with men, what men do in every sense is that, you know, you go into an area and in almost a military sense and you establish a space, a safe space, you know, and, uh, you know, not from free feelings or whatever, but, uh, you know, I, you, you secure a space and you take control of that space. And then everything outside of that space is beyond your control. You know, everything outside of that is, is chaotic. And what men really do is they create order in the midst of chaos because the world is chaotic and they're trying to create a place of order. And so then, you know, everything that's within your perimeter is everything that you really care about and you want to protect. And, and, uh, and that's, you know, everything outside of it is, you know, them, you know, like it's, it's the unknown. And uh, that's, I think, just a really important concept in terms of what men do in the world is that we want to create order from chaos. And it happens at every level of things. Um, as far as like other perimeters, like socially and things like that, like you were talking about, it's you know, obviously, yeah, you have your your closest group of people and it expands outward. And, and you know, that, that I love the metaphor of, and that's why I talk about the fire in the dark. There's a metaphor of fire. And that's what we've always been around is this campfire. And close as the campfire, you can see things and you can mm -hmm. understand things and you know what's there and who's there and everybody around it is important. And then it gets less and less light as it goes further, further out. And, uh, you know, I also, I think in the way men talked about uh, perimeters in terms of socially, uh, you know, in terms of Dunbar's number, which you can only really care about like 150 yeah. people. And, uh, and also if you, if you look at like the military, when people interview the military, like the people, in the, the guys like platoon or his, you know, fire team or whatever are the people who he will care about most. And then like, as you get to bigger units, they're like, that's just guys, you know, that, that's just guys out there that are technically on our team. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, we keep people, people are tribal. So, you know, the people who are closest into their tribe are the people that they care about most. And that's natural. And again, it's, this is, this is the way that humans operate. And uh, we're told that it's not, you know, that it's that we're supposed to care about everything and everyone in the world, but we can't. We're like physically incapable of doing that. And and as uh, I think your reader just said, um, you know, to say that you do, you know, if you love everyone, you do, you love no one. You know, it cheapens the entire uh, word. Uh, you know, to, if you really care about someone, you care about them to the exclusion of others. You know, mm -hmm. they care about them more. Yeah, actually, that'll. That kind of ties into the notion of the empire of nothing, right? Because they want you to care about this like empire, which is essentially nothing. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the empire of nothing concept? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way, for, you know, a lot of your readers might be younger, but uh, uh, the never ending story is a really good way. And I didn't think of this when I wrote it, but I've used it many times afterward mm -hmm. is uh, this idea that there's you know, nothing really means anything. The never ending kind of story was. What was that? Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or is that something else? No, it's, it's actually called a Never Ending Story movie, okay. where they basically and they actually fight nothing. Basically, it's a child, it's a children's story, mm. and uh, you know, like basically, it's the absence of dreams and the absence mm. of identity is coming, and it's kind of just destroying everything around it. And I think that that's what's happening with you know globalism and like this monoculture mm -hmm. that we have is is that you know all these things that were very intensely meaningful to people they kind of want to take that away and, and whether it's, you know, religion or, you know, racial groups or ethnic groups or like you know, any of these things, they want to take that away and replace that with, well, we are the source of what you care about. You know, whatever's mm -hmm. trending on Twitter is what you care about now. And so it's just, this, there's no fixed point. And that's why I talk about it as being an empire of nothing. Like for, you know, for like a Christian, like there's the Bible is like the fixed point. Like everything is less holy as you get out from there. And uh, for any of us, uh, in any of us who have any kind of moral center, whatever that is, you know, we have a very specific you know, idea of what is right and wrong and what we care about. And as you get further and further away from that, things become more profane. And so, the you know, the empire of nothing, I think, is just this idea that they're eroding culture on every level and uh, identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a this or I'm a that where your identities are like in, in flux and they're consumeristic identities. Like I buy things and I, I listen to this band and therefore I have an identity rather than like I have this family that I'm tied to and, and, and uh, this long lineage of people. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it's just an erasure of culture is what I start, uh, think about it, and, and replacing it with consumerism. You've um, you spent a good amount of time, you know, in the past, not so much recently, uh, visiting parts of the world and talking about things like Germanic tribes and uh, mm-hmm. Nordic, you know, Viking sort of stuff. Um, more recently, it it seems like the trend has kind of moved more to like stay solar, which I'm not totally clear on. So I want to get some clarity on that from you. Yeah. What well, like, what was the shift with that? And what did that mean for you? Well, I think personally, you know, as a lot of people do, a lot of people get into Germanic, you know, paganism or whatever, because they are looking for some connection to something bigger, some connection to their ancestry and, uh, the past, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, like I, it's like, Oh, a lot of people are like, well, I'm Scandinavian or I'm German or whatever. And so like they, they start reaching for that. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's a good starting place. But then I think that what happened for me is that as I studied that, because obviously I had rituals for that, and I was part of, you know, the tribe that did that. And, uh, you know, I, I know a lot about it. Uh, but what happened for me, the more research you do, you realize that that's just a point in history. You know, it's just, it's, it's a pocket in history where they believe these things. And these are great stories and they're, they're, but they're part of a bigger story. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's really what I got into with Fire in the Dark. It's like I started out writing a book uh, called Odin Thor Frey. And then as the more research you do, you're like, well, this thing really became this thing. And this big thing became this thing. And let's talk about this big story rather than like just these guys. Mm. And, 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 for, and obviously there's a lot of uh, unfortunate attachments that you get when you talk about just the German stuff, because you know, there's a history there mm. of the people who want to talk about just the German stuff. You know, it, it gets wrapped in with Nazi stuff and so forth. And that's just really tiresome. Uh, cause you know, it, that, you know, it, it confuses the message of every centuries of talk. like, you know, history is yeah. like confined to like six years of world war led by a lunatic. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's really, it's a, it's a bummer because there's stuff that like, okay, well, you, people are like, well, runes are a hate symbol. Well, runes are like, you know, a thousand years no. ago. So, so the, but, uh, it, you know, it's unfortunately it gets mixed up with that. And then when it gets into, you know, it, that's the reason why I, I kind of moved into a broader perspective, which is what I call solar idealism, which is what uh, Fire in the Dark is really about. Like, let's talk about this idea of the father and what that really means, because there's a father in every one of these pantheons. And that's, you know, what what is, what is that about? We, why do we keep creating that? And uh, what is the warrior god? Like Thor is just one in a long chain of, you know, some guy who kills a serpent. And, uh, you know, why are we, why do we keep going back to the storm god that wields lightning and thunder? Uh, you know, like Zeus or so many other people before him and Indra. And, uh, you know, like, it's like, let's look at these big, big ideas rather than one, one spot in history. Yeah. Uh, super chat here from Moff. Can you touch on judging people from becoming a barbarian as in, uh, we shouldn't judge how somebody looks versus it's usually a good indicator of who that person is. I mean, I, I, I don't know where that is in that book specifically. I've written a lot of books now, so that's a, it's like, when did I say that? But, uh, you know, obviously, I think we do judge people by their looks, and that's normal human behavior. We always have. Uh, that group, that you know, people put out signals, and they put them out intentionally. Like, mm-hmm. who am I trying to be? You know, what signal am I putting out? Like, like I'm, I'm, you know, sending out a message. You know, that's why, like, uh, Tanner Gizzi, like, uh, you know, it was a good, you know, good friend of mine. And uh, he, you know, talks about what your clothing is always sending a message. Like, what are you trying to say? Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's, you know, so people, you know, it's like when someone's wearing, you know, the Muslim thing on their head. I'm like, you're telling me that you're part of a group that I'm not part of. Mm-hmm. That's that's what you want to say that. And that's fine. Uh, but that's what you're saying. And so yeah, it's important, I think, for us, because we can't sit down and get to know like little every single person in the world. Um, you know, and sometimes people surprise you. You know, a lot of times they'll surprise you, but on a general curve, just as we can say that women generally tend to behave this way and men generally tend to say behave this way. You know, if you see a guy whose pants are like halfway down to his ankles walking around the street, you know, he's probably into some bad things. (laughs) He's probably not a productive guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, whether he's making trouble or he just likes a band, we don't know. But you're like, well, that guy's not like going, he's not headed to the winner's circle. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, you can say that about a lot of people, you know, like, you know, like what, what you know, signals are women trying to get, come out? And, and also like, you know, if you're healthy or unhealthy, that sounds a message too. If you're like morbidly obese, what are you telling people about who you are? Uh, you know, and, and people who change that, then you've told, you've also told another story. 
that you are capable of changing that. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I think we always, we always judge people by the, by the way that they look and, and, uh, it's, it's good to a certain extent. Like, uh, you know, if people judge you a little bit because you're a fat piece of shit, maybe you should stop being a fat piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there's a whole narrative now that's, that's, that's trying to like convince society to be more inclusive and accepting of everybody's life choices. And if they're type two diabetic and 450 pounds and, you know, on the front page of Cosmopol- Cosmopolitan in a bikini, that's beautiful now, right? Because they said right. so. Um, but I mean, you still have the capacity for independent thought, basically. I mean, I, I would fully agree with you. Um, speaking of the notion of having a look or, you know, judging somebody, you know, by their look. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you saw Jack and I, I guess, standing together, we look pretty much, the same. I mean, we look almost identical now, except for the glasses and my bald, beard. Bald guys with beards, they're like, they, they were basically the same person. You know? Yeah. What's, what, What's the deal with being jacked and competent and able and being able to fight? Because being able to fight is something that I've taken up in the last three years. You know, I've always been pretty big, you know, got on therapeutic testosterone, obviously, to, you know, to maintain that mm-hmm. when the time was right. You lose your hair. I don't bother holding on to scraps and playing the games of transplants and all the bullshit. It's just, you know, you just surrender to it. And it's like, fuck it, just shave it off. Right. right. Um, how do you how do you define a look for yourself as a guy? Because I think a lot of guys struggle with that too right i mean like one of the things that you've got going on too is you're you're very well tatted like you've got tats all over your body too right so how do you how do you decide to uh, i don't know like send that signal or that message to the world as you go about it because i mean people look at you when you enter a room people will look at you when you go into a store people will look at you in a social environment and they're going to judge you um you know for me like the feedback that i always get is like you know like you're a big dude that looks like you could fuck shit up and that's what I want, right? Like I want, like, I don't sure. want to scare people, but I want right. people to know that like, you're not going to fuck with me basically. Right. So how do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, you have to analyze what you, I guess, what message you're sending out and what message you want to send out and embody. I mean, for me personally, uh, it was important. I've talked to a lot of guys uh, who write about masculinity. It's like, uh, if I'm going to be this guy, who's going to talk about masculinity, I can't be like, you know, just a slob and a loser and, and whatever. I have to try right. to embody that to the best, to the best of my ability. Uh, so I can't just become gross, you know, and, uh, I want to be able to carry that. And, uh, you know, so as far as, you know, like your looks and your choices it just depends, you know, where, where you are and what kind of social group you are, you're in and, you know, who you have to interact with. Um, you know, like the tattoo thing is you don't get to actually take those off. <laughs> you know, like, so I started getting tattoos at like, you know, 19. I don't know if I would do it again. Uh, but uh, once you've made that committed, well, on now I'm going to be a heavily tattooed person. I've already made that choice. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't do that as a threat display. It is. It, I mean, it isn't anymore. I mean, like, you know, all, all these hipsters with tiny little spaghetti arms have, you know, t- tattoos. But uh, for a certain group of people, you know, it, there is a stereotype that you fit into when you're bald and, ha- and muscular and have tattoos. You're like, did that guy go to prison? You know, there's a little bit of that vibe mm. there, um, which is, you know, a threat display is helpful in, in life. I mean, uh, I, I, that's one of the things I've noticed uh, moving to Arizona versus like some other places I've lived is like, I'll go through the grocery store. I'm like, I'm glad that there are several dudes in here who I do not want to fight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's nice to, to have that. I'm like, oh, there are still men in the world, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, walking around. Uh, whereas, you know, in Portland, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't encounter that as often. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, it's important to have that kind of physical presence and create it. And it, you create that mostly with your body, uh, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, whether or not how much of your body you hide or show or whatever, but, uh, you know, it, yeah, as far as, I mean, wh- where are you going as far as, what do you want to talk about as far as like a look goes? Uh, well, you know, a lot of guys come to me for advice and help on, you know, things going on in their life. And like, one of the first things that I'll always look at, it's like, okay, well, why are you fat? Or why are you a toothpick? Right. Like, why, like, why haven't you done the work on yourself? Because you're sending a message to the world about the way that you look when you enter a room, right? Like I'm somewhere between six, two and six, three, 212, 215 pounds. Usually where I hover, I'm pretty lean. I box, you know, two, mm-hmm. sometimes two and a half times a week. I train every day. I cycle like I'm, I'm fit. I mean, if you go to my Instagram, like you'll see, right? Like I'm not a fucking fat pig sort of thing. Right. And I don't think guys understand the importance of that because 
Well, there's any number of reasons. Maybe they listen to too many people say, just be yourself or just get people to love you for who you are and blah, blah, blah. Like there's all these narratives out there. So I, so I just wanted to hear your take, you know, as a guy that's written so many books on masculinity and strength and courage and, you know, like the alpha sort of shit, you know, sort of thing to, you know, to distill it down yeah. to one sort of term. I just wanted to hear your take on all that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it's, you know, and if you are in decent shape, you tend to not respect the opinions of people who aren't. You know, mm -hmm. you're like uh, something uh, people, people will just write it off, you know, like, like, oh, well, that's interesting, fat guy. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is something to be aware of. And, it, it, and, and one of the most interesting things about your physical presence is mm -hmm. that you, it changes the way other people interact with you. Mm -hmm. And then that changes you because that changes like, who you are. So if you're walking in a room and you have this expectation that people are going to see you in a certain way. And that you carry yourself differently and uh, it, it changes actually who you are, you know, like, uh, and that, I think that's really interesting. And so like people say like one of the best things you can do about, you know, changing yourself is actually to just change your physical appearance and become more fit. And it, it is interesting. Like people, you know, I, I as a, yeah, this happened to me mostly as an older guy. Uh, so, you know, I'm, in my mind, I'm not that guy sometimes. And then, you know, I walk into a supermarket and somebody is, you know, somebody's like out of the blue is like, well, I wouldn't want to fight you. I'm like, I feel like, <laughs> who are you talking to? You know, I'm not here to and, fight, uh, man. I'm here like, to get some shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm not like barely awake. I'm here to get some rock star. Like, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but that happens. And so like that changes your world. And I would say that's a big difference between men and women. Mm -hmm. it, something that I think that not a lot of people think about is that the experience that women have versus the experience men have in the world as to, you know, whether or not they're going to be, you know, have a violent encounter or whether women are pieces of meat and they know it to like everybody, you know, like they know they can raise their hand and get laid like right now, like if they're a five. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they can go and uh, men just have a completely different experience in the world. And so this this physical form that we inhabit, like changes the way it changes, changes our reality. Yeah, it's a game changer. I mean, I I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was a young kid, like when I was a teenager, I was I was real thin, like I was skinny. You know, I was pretty much the height that I'm at now by like 15, 16, maybe 145 pounds. I was skinny as fuck. Right. So it's like, you know, you start doing some push-ups, you lift some weights, you know, you take classes in high school, like aerobics and weight training, you start to, you know, like learn the fundamentals. And my entire upper body is covered in third degree birds, you know, my chest, my arms, like, I don't know if you can see on that arm over there, but it's covered in like, you know, third degree burns and you can change what's under the skin. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the first step in improving yourself as a guy is to change the outward appearance of yourself. Like, I believe personally you have an obligation as a man to become the biggest, strongest version that you can possibly become. I mean, within reason, without doing stupid shit to harm your body and, you know, taking right. bolus doses of training, crazy shit like that, obviously. Right. But, you know, you have an obligation to put your best foot forward to become the best version of yourself. That includes looking good, right? I mean, women right. put on makeup, they put on heels, push up bras, you know, they dye their mm -hmm. hair, like they'll do everything they can to, you know, portray the optics of femininity and beauty with the exception of a demographic that just says, just be yourself sort of thing. Um, I believe the same thing's for true for guys and it has been forever and it, and it's a bit of a mm -hmm. lost art for a lot of dudes. I mean, uh, I've got a glimmer of hope because now I go to the gym, I see a mm -hmm. lot of young kids in there, a lot of young yeah. boys, you know, yeah. lifting and they're, you know, they're there. I mean, they're not doing everything right, but I probably didn't do everything right either when I was fucking 18, but sure. they're in there doing it. Right. Right. You don't, you don't see that so much with the, uh, ladies, you know, it's, you know, it's a lot of young boys doing that. A lot, a lot of young, young boys are starting to fight too, which is good. You know, they're going to dojos or picking up rolling, they're yeah. picking up boxing, you know, whatever they happen to like. So it's, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah. And I think it's been really to a certain extent an influence of, you know, the kind of stuff that you and I have done, uh, as far as like, uh, there's a big influence that's coming. Yeah, you know, I always forget how much how many people's ears we get into. Uh, there's a lot of young men who are looking for like, what is masculinity? What should I be? And then they they do hear the advice from you or me or from uh, you know Ryan Eckler or Jocko or whatever that oh you should go do this and this, this, you yeah. know. And uh, so there are a lot of guys. I mean, uh, I, my jujitsu school uh, I went to last night. Uh, first class was 50 people. Uh, you know, which was crazy. Uh, a lot that's of people big. in there. And, and and something that's interesting that I've pointed out recently is that men in America used to like, you know, die after high school to a certain extent. They would go, you know, do their job or business or whatever. But uh, in a lot of ways, they used to just stop 
you know, like doing anything athletic or physical or whatever. Mm-hmm. And now you have dudes who are like in their thirties, forties going in to learn jiu-jitsu and like become dangerous and stuff. And that's, that's something that wasn't happening, you know, 30 years ago, which is, yeah. which is kind of interesting. It's like dudes fought and did football or whatever in high school and college. And then that that's, then they did nothing and just, yeah. you know, rotted for, you know, but now we have people, that, a lot of men who want to keep it up and uh, you know, you know, just, you know, improve their lives constantly. And I think that's a really positive change. Yeah, it's a great thing. Got a, a superhero from this guy. Something to watch. Says lone wolf, only family around, no friends. Thoughts? I guess he's looking for advice on maybe improving that. Yeah, I mean, you got to work on that. I mean, I just moved to a new city. Like I said, I oriented myself around a jujitsu gym because that's where I'm going to talk to people. Uh, I'm gonna, I mean, that's the first thing I always advise. I mean, it's stupid. It's like a CrossFit thing at this point. Like you know, like you should go to. It's like like a cult, mm-hmm. but. Uh, Really, I mean, it's where you're going to, you know, there's a certain kind of interaction that you're getting with a guy when he's trying to strangle you mm-hmm. in, in, in this kind of friendly competitiveness, uh, you know, and you're happy with striking or whatever too. And, uh, and then you're, you're, you're communicating in a way that builds trust automatically. And so that you can, you know, then you're, you know, my, in between rounds, we might be talking about real estate or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you're just connecting on some level and, uh, you know, you're not going to do that in almost any other environment. And so I think that that's a great way to get started. And, you know, if you don't have friends, you have to go find ways to build stuff. I mean, I'm kind of an introvert naturally myself. And so like, I'm not going to be the one who walks up to somebody and be like, Hey, how you doing? Uh, that's not who I am. But uh, you know, you have to put yourself in an environment where that can happen. Actually my best uh, friend in Salt Lake city that I made when I was there, um, I specifically, I needed a tattoo. Somebody recommended this guy was a tattoo artist. And he, he was like, oh, you really like my brother. He's a tattoo artist, whatever. And I was like, well, I, I'm looking for friends. I need to book an appointment. And I booked an appointment. He tattooed the inside of my hand and was impressed that I wasn't being a baby about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we actually became really, really good friends. And he's one of my really good friends to this day. So, you know, but I, I specifically did that because I'm like, hey, well, these are the kind of people I like um that i'm probably gonna get along with like you know i'll book an appointment and you know you know tip him well and be you know like it, let's start a relationship and a conversation you know and so that's, yeah, that's seem complicated right just go yeah. and do go and immerse yeah. yourself into things and activities that one you enjoy that two would force you to compete and have an roi in your life i mean going like learning how to fight learning how to be violent is a good mm-hmm. skill to learn i mean you ask um any one of these mma guys right they'll tell you the exact same thing right i mean you know just go to a dojo and and get your ass kicked and get punched in the face a few times and you'll make friends. Trust me, you will. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, it takes a while. There are some places where they like, don't, don't they specifically won't remember your name for like the first six months because people come in and out and go around. Yeah. But you know, over time, then you become like best friends, you know, because you've had that experience. And I even started recently because I'm, because I'm in a new town. Um, my preference generally is, you know, I have headphones on at the gym and I'm like in my own space uh, but I was like, I need to not do that. Uh, you know, like I have my, I'll use it for the, whatever PR that I'm trying to set or whatever, but, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I take my headphones off. So I'm accessible. Mm-hmm. And then and surprise, then people come up and talk to you. People talk to you, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, so just make yourself accessible is part of it too. Speaking of the concept of, uh, violence and fighting, uh, Andrew Tate is blowing up on the internet right now. Um, what are your thoughts on him and some of the conversations that he has? I mean, I, I, I mostly follow him on Twitter, I think. And we have a lot of mutual friends and people who have met him and, and so forth. I think uh, I, I know a guy who's in his his war room or whatever right now. And uh, I mean, I don't have any really negative opinions uh, about him. And, and I think that, you know, it seems like uh, there's a thing happening in the, the manosphere right now uh, where there's kind of what's being called a Christ wave. Or like they're all sudden a bunch of guys who are going into this like Christian conservative thing. And uh, mm-hmm. in, in a way, I like that Andrew Tate is kind of on the other side of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, oh, I'm on a yacht in the UAE and, <laughs> and here's my Rolex. And, uh, you know, whereas I'm not that guy either. Uh, I like that there's that balance because I think that we need that because I don't think that, uh, you know, everyone's going to like march off to church and get married and have a, a little like white picket fence life. Uh, you know, we need, you know, I, I like the concept of the barbarian, like the barbarian, like uh, a king who does what the fuck he wants. Uh, you know, that's kind of a big, a big thing for me. So, I mean, he seems he's definitely a barbarian king of his own world, it seems like.
So yeah, he definitely know. marches to the beat yeah. of his own drum. Speaking of the For Manosphere, sure. um, mm -hmm. that's evolved over the years too. Like uh, I got introduced to it in 2015, uh, 2016 or 17 or something like that. Um, I kind of like leaned in. I'm like, oh, this is great. There's some good information here. And then I started to interact with some of the people and I realized that a lot of the people aren't what you think they are. They're, you know, for the most part, either deceptive or fraudulent. So I took a step out of it back in December. Um, the Manosphere, is it still the same thing? Like, do you still see it as the same thing? Like, how do you view the evolution, the evolution of the Manosphere? Because I see it as like the Mano Swamp now, basically. Well, it, 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 it's it's all kinds of as you said as we talked about there's concentric circles of everything right right um, and uh, I think it's become a lot bigger I mean it, it's a terrible name uh, oh, terrible because name it comes Bad from PR. Yeah, it, well I mean it, it, I know where it comes from I mean when they used to have blogs they called them the blogosphere mm -hmm. whereas no one blogs anymore and that's not a thing but that was where the manosphere started it is where it was the blogosphere and then the manosphere. Uh, was the men's blogs, and I was writing. It sounds like a gay nightclub. Like, let's be honest. Well, that, you're right. <laughs> I didn't really think about that, but yeah, you're right. But uh, it is a, it is a, you know, it was a, it was a collection of blogs. At you know, at a particular time, I was writing one mm -hmm. for one called the Spearhead for the way of men ever came out, and uh, you know, it was a lot of fathers' right stuff, and and it was like fathers' right stuff and and MRA and and. Uh, uh, your um, pickup artists and, and so yeah. forth. And uh, society really didn't care that much about it. It was this kind of weird thing that was existing out there. And now the really, I, I always say the broadest manosphere is uh, Joe Rogan's audience. Uh, you know, it's really in the biggest sense, that is the, you know, it, where are you going to connect with the most dudes who are interested in being dudes? Well, mm -hmm. it's probably, you know, Joe Rogan's audience. And then there's like all kinds of things that are, you know, little pockets of it around that. So it, there's this big thing out there um, it, 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 of men talking about masculinity, which no one was talking about masculinity except for like feminists and trans people and whatever, uh, you know, in the 90s and, and, and whatever. But uh, now you have all these people, you have your Jockos and your and your uh, Jordan Petersons and all these big figures. And there's a brilliant uh, larger worldwide conversation happening about like, you know, pro masculinity and pro masculine va values. And I think that's all part of what you could call the manosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, there's also like, obviously, you know, there's, you know, all kinds of men's coaches. I mean, you do coaching, I think, and, and uh, you know, there are good and bad mm -hmm. in that there are guys who are good. And there's guys who are like, you literally got your shit together like a week ago. <laughs> like why are you coaching? <laughs> yeah, like I mean, like everybody wants to be coached in the same way, but it, you know, it's like I understand it. Uh, when I first got started getting in shape, uh, I went and got a personal trainer certification because I was like, oh, I can help you know fat guys get in shape or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you realize that what for being a personal trainer really is for most people is counting reps for like middle aged women. Mm -hmm. But like that's where the money is for a lot of it, except for the online trainers. Like I have a really good friend who is an online trainer, makes a bunch of money. But, um, you know, there's all kinds of niches now, but, you know, you, I, I, I see the impulse like, oh, I got my shit together. I want to help other guys get their shit together, you mm. know, but, uh, you know, I think sometimes maybe you need to let that settle for a little bit, you know, like rather than like, I, I mean, I don't do coaching because I'm like, well, you know, like I said, I don't think that I think most men have the most problems with, with their women, uh, you know, like that's the, the one of their bigger women and money. And, mm. uh, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm the qualified to really give that advice, but, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, but the, you know, there's tons of coaches out there. And uh, you know, like I said, you're going to have guys who are like, gee, literally they realize that there's money there and that there are suckers and wherever you have suckers and money, you're going to have some opportunists. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're also going to have some guys who are, you know, have a quality product. Like they, you know, I mean, I've heard, I mean, Tate was a good example. Like uh, I, I've, his group, I think is really expensive to join. And then, but I've heard, talked to guys who were like, yeah, I make a ton of money now. It was totally worth it. <laughs> so, you know, he's providing a service that they're getting something out of. Mm. And, uh, and so that's, that's good. But yeah, obviously there's also a lot of other people who want to like deal with your woundology or whatever. And, and, uh, you know, talk about your pain and like, just take your money for, for nothing. And uh, how do you, you know, how do you separate guys that are, that are the real deal as far as a source of information? Um, mm -hmm. even maybe somebody to look up to, you know, sort of thing versus the ones that, 
are potential fraudsters? Well, I think look at the, you know, this track record. Mm. I mean, I have a big thing personally, cause you know, I've, I've, I've had to take the heat. Uh, I have a big thing with anonymous guys. Like there are a lot of anonymous guys out there and, and, uh, you know, I understand why you would not want to have an internet presence. I understand that a hundred percent. That's a, mm -hmm. that makes a good sense for most people really. But, uh, if you're going to be a voice, like you gotta, gotta put yourself out there so people can see who you really are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like, well, what's this guy's track record? What has he actually done? Would you uh, trade you know, like, places with him? I think is the is like the gold standard. It's like you know, if this guy has yeah. something to say, would I trade places with him? Right? Like, would I want to walk yeah. a mile in his shoes? Yeah. Do I want to be more like that guy? You mm -hmm. know, like that's that's what idealism is. Like, do I want to be more like that guy, uh, or is he just saying the things that like sound like what I want to hear? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's that's you know, obviously a thing that happens is that you know there are guys who are just saying like if you you could string together masculine trigger words. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that, you know, like, I mean, I do it in my writing, you know, but you know, like I, I put myself out there. I'm like, here's who I am. I actually do. I have to go do jujitsu because I have to do a fighting sport. Cause I told you to, you know, you like I have, do you ever get into competitions? Time. Like, you know, actually like uh, ranks ranked. I mean, well, it's, cool. it's like everybody is in competition, you know, like in jujitsu, yeah. obviously you're rolling with dudes all the time. Um, I've never actually competed yet. I was going to, and then, you know, the, whatever, you know, 2020 happened. Uh, I had that and it's, it's on my list of things to do. I think I would like it to, to do it probably before I build up next time. Mm -hmm. Cause I think you should, yeah, as you, as you get higher in the ranks, I feel like you should have had that experience. Yeah. Like what's the point uh, of learning a skill if you don't be, test it? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I started this at like whatever by your, know, you know, mid forties. So mm -hmm. like, I mean, I'm not really expecting to go to like Abu Dhabi and like, you know, <laughs> to compete with the top guys. I'm just trying to get better. You yeah, know, that's my goal so, too. I I want to yeah. I want to get into an actual boxing match, uh, you know, an amateur boxing match, just to test the skills yeah. that I've learned, see what it's all about. Um, yeah. And that's that's hard because I was doing boxing for a while too, and and like uh, there's like there was like USA boxing, which was like you know boxing, you know, with the headgear where it was like you know kind of you know, uh, you know, like the official kind. And uh, and uh, my coach was trying to find me a fight there for a little. Bit, I'm like you know if I'm lucky, I might be able to go fight and beat up somebody's dad. You know, like it was like, kind of like, <laughs> like it was really hard to find a, a fight for a guy over 40, you know, cause just there, okay. there are not a lot of guys doing it, you know? So okay. it's a, it was a tricky thing, but you know, it, it just depends on what area you're into. So well, I'll fight somebody's dad. I don't care as long as he's about the same height and weight. I'll, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, back to whole, you know, like advice stuff with the Mano swap. There's a lot of women I've noticed that have, that have entered this space in the last couple of years. And a lot of the, like sound bites that they're, um, you know, broadcasting sound exactly the same as what the guys have been saying for decades now, uh, mm -hmm. several decades. In fact, um, we were talking at the opening about listening to women tell men how to be men. Um, do you have any opinion or, or like, have you seen some of these women, you know, speaking to men in the Mano swamp about, you know, how to get girls and dates and sort of thing like that? Cause it seems kind of interesting, you know, to me, because there was a time when I was involved in it where it's like, you know, they were like, no, we got to keep women out. The, you know, it's pointless to have them here. They can't tell women how to get girls. It's like asking a fish, like a, a fish how to fish. You need to ask a fisherman, blah, 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 sort of thing. What do you think about women teaching guys how to be, you know, men and how to get girls and date and marry and all that sort of stuff? You know, there's a thing that happens with subcultures that I'm very wary of because I've been, I'm always part of a subculture. Uh, you know, I'm mm -hmm. a subcultural kind of guy. And, uh, you know, if you have a group of outcast men, um, women can sweep into that group and become very important very quickly. And they, they become kind of queen bees because uh, they're like, oh, well, she's saying the thing that we're saying. Like, she's she gets it. You know, she's and uh, and so I they can find a girl just like, like her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they get carte blanche to kind of like just come in and be everywhere because they, you know, like. I mean, it, it, there's a good PR representation of it. If you're part of this group of men and whatever, and women don't want anything to do with you, that's, you know, like that says something on itself. So if you have women that are also like, yes, what they're saying is correct, that there's some value to that. But as far as, you know, coaching men and telling them how to be men, you know, like it, it would be better to have women out there, you know, you know, saying, hey, this is how men really are to other women rather than them having them tell men how to be men, which is should always be treated with decent submission. 
And uh, even if they're good at it, like I had some dude like who I thought knew me try to like, you know, I thought he had someone who wanted to interview me and I actually got a sales pitch for this woman who wanted to life coach me. And I'm like, can you imagine I have a female <laughs> life coach? And like, like, and like, I would never be able to show my face again. Like, Jeff like, Donovan <laughs> takes life coaching from Becky Smith. Yeah, yeah. And whenever a dude has a female life coach, I'm like, oh, that's a red flag. Like yeah. that's, that's a red flag right away. So, uh, you know, it's, Whereas, you know, they can probably tell them what they need to hear to a certain extent, go through the checklist of like, you know, it's not that hard sometimes, but um, still, yeah, that's not something I think that women should be doing, you know, like they should, it, like I said. Yeah, it turns into an echo chamber where it's just tits in a blouse saying, you know, saying the same thing that I did four years ago, right? It's like, okay, that's, that's cool. Yeah. There, and there's Maybe. a lot of that. We've both been around for a while. Like there's a lot of like, it's like, oh, really? That's funny that you're saying that more marketable guy than I am. But like, I've already said that. And like, yeah. Yeah, you're like yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of that out there happening right now. I'm like, I go through my Twitter feed. I'm like, ah, okay, where'd you get that one, buddy? You know? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, you're actually right. Because like, like yeah. they should be talking to, to women. Like women should be talking to women just like men should be talking to men. But I think the problem is, is that women are very suspicious of other women when it comes to this stuff and they don't want to listen to it anyway. The only time I think women are willing to listen to advice on how to be a, a good woman, you know, I guess, um, is when they kind of like, you know, hit, you know, hit the wall and they're well under the thirties or forties and they're like, guys aren't really responding the way that they used to. And I'm not sure why. And then that's when they start to sort of look for the information. Um, kind of brings me to the point of like, you You've spoken about, um, I'm going to butcher it, so you're going to have to correct me, but something along the lines of uh, being a good man is not the same thing as being good at being a man. Yeah. 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 Can you explain that? Yeah, it was a really important thing, uh, a really important distinction when I sat down to try and define what masculinity is, is because that's where a lot of confusion is, is in the morality piece, because morality is tribal. And, uh, you know, if you have a, a group, a religious group, whatever, they're going to have their own morality. And then they want to be like masculinity is what, whatever it, we say it is. And I wanted to look at what masculinity really is and uh, what it always, is always and everywhere. What would a, a, you know, a Muslim guy or a guy from 500 years ago understand about masculinity that's still the same? And so, you know, I had to separate out. So, like, it, there is a big difference between being a good man which usually has to do with the morality of your people or your group or your, you know, whatever group that you're in. And then, you know, being good at being a man, which has to do with basic masculinity, which is very, very much rooted in that gang masculinity. Like, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, is he strong? Is he courageous? Is you know what he's doing? Does you know, like, uh, you know, is he going to be someone you can push around or not? Uh, you know, th that's basic core masculinity that all men understand always and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the window dressing of morality is not a part of that. You know, we, we, you know, we can look at a room full of guys from a completely different culture. You can probably be like, I don't want to fuck with that one. <laughs> you know, like or, or the, that one's in charge mm -hmm. or, it, it, or that one's definitely like the lowest guy on the totem pole. We can, we can do that without knowing any, without caring about whether they're good people. You know, and, and it was also important to separate that out because, you know, we can lie to ourselves about like, well, they're not a good man because they don't do the things that I do. And then you can kind of put yourself on top of a pedestal because you're a good person. Like I, you know, I'm a good person, so therefore I'm good at being a man. And that guy's not a real man. Well, that guy, you know, is, is in prison, but he, he's pretty good at being a man. Uh, you know, he's he's not a good dude, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I mean, prison is a very masculine place. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of guys competing with each other. It's very cutthroat and whatever. And you would say that with a lot of different environments. And uh, th those men are not good guys necessarily. I mean, uh, but a lot of them, you know, they're good. At, they're good at being men. And so it's a big it's a big distinction. I think that people need to understand because they get really confused and it becomes like masculinity is about whatever the guys on our team say it is. You know, mm -hmm. so or that guy that guy took advantage of someone, so he's not a real man. And they're like, yeah, well, cute, thanks. that's oh, the one I wanted to come up. I used Darth Vader in the in the chapter. You know, I was mm -hmm. like, well, was Darth, is Darth Vader a pussy? You mm -hmm. know, like that, you know, because he's that guy. And uh, the one I came up with the other day, I think I want to put it into a talk in the future is, is Genghis Khan. You know, like, OK, well, you fathered half of whatever, like China, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, but, he, you know, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't like he wasn't like all these things that they want to say that masculinity is. 
Uh, but uh, so is a guy know, like he, Genghis Khan a good man he, and good at being a man? His own tribe. I don't know if he was a good man or not. Mm-hmm. You know, if they if they would say he was a good man, it's probably the only people who can judge that. Mm-hmm. Um, if historically, it's like we're putting our shit onto him. Uh, you know, did he did he do a lot of good things for the people around him? I don't know. Uh, you know, did they think he was like amazing? Obviously, a lot of people fought for him, and they probably did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, whether he's a good man is, is a subjective question. But whether he's good at being a man, he won the fucking game. <laughs> like mm-hmm. he, he was clearly good at being a man. Uh, so that's that's why that distinction is so important. Like he's just a really good a, example. Is there a good modern example today of a guy that's a good man but also good at being a man? Um, they're they're hard to find. Um, you know, I there are a few guys who I believe in, um, who I believe that are trying to be good men, um, mm-hmm. and I actually trust. And uh, Ian Smith is a guy who I really like. Um, I've met a couple times in person. Mm-hmm. And I feel like he's trying to do the right thing. He's a flawed guy, but I mean, he's a very masculine dude. And also he's trying to do the right thing mm-hmm. and, and live according to his own morality. And, uh, and he, so he's, he's a guy that I would put out as an example. Um, I also, and I've told in his face, I mean, Ryan Nickler, I think, you know, he, he's, uh, he's, he's, tr- I really trust him to try and be fair and try mm-hmm. and do the right thing, even if it's not what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. And that's probably, you know, as far as like leadership type of guys, um, those are two guys that stand out for me. Uh, for yeah, I had and Ryan on I a I know them Because a lot of guys might be, but I don't trust them because I don't know them. Got it. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, I want to respect your time. I mean, I usually do these for about an hour. Um, let's do a let's do a quick uh, wrap up and talk about your uh, books, uh, you know, cool. and where people can find you and stuff. So. If you guys go to Amazon, you'll find um, Jack's stuff. Uh, just search for Jack Donovan. He's got all of his books and his titles there. Um, do you still write your blog and update it? Oh, no, I don't. I, no one reads blogs anymore. I, I, I send okay. out a newsletter occasionally when I want to do an essay or I, you know, I had a, we had a project called Chess Magazine where I put some essays up there. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, mostly, mostly just, uh, social media like everybody else. And then, you know, if I read another book, I read another book, who knows? Yeah. So, uh, start the world on Instagram and surprisingly you're on Twitter now. I remember a few years ago, yeah. you were asked at a conference why you're not on Twitter. And I, I can't remember what you said, something about being a shithole basically, which you're not wrong about. I hate, I, I, I still don't like it. Uh, yeah. I, I still don't like it. And I, and I do think it's done horrible things for culture generally. It's very snipey. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, oh, like, oh, I can, I can say something bad about you and you'll know it, you know, like it's kind of, yeah. kind of snipey attitude. But, uh, it, when Elon Musk said he was going to buy it, I was like, well, maybe it could be useful because mm-hmm. I just, in 2017, they just wanted to like put the cancel button on me right away. But, uh, you know, now I was like, well, let's see what happens. And that, you know, I don't know if he's actually going to end up buying it or not, whether they're going to make I think it buy the deal it or fell through. He's, he's actually going but, through court now because he backed out of the deal and they had, yeah. had a warm agreement so it's kind of funny because he he backed out of the deal because so many of the accounts are are fraudulent they're like sock puppet accounts avatars are run by fucking you know farms and stuff like that so now that he has to go to court they're going to be forced to tell him how many of the accounts are actually fake accounts yeah and he posted a meme about that like said that that was his intention which may or may not have been the case but it was kind of funny i'm like these you know if he's trolling them he's like the mask he's like the king of meme lords (laughs) right for sure for sure. Ship posting deluxe. All right, brother. Um, yeah, so on yeah, Twitter, I am at ph2t3r. ph2t3r. Yeah. So yeah, Jack Allen on, was taken long ago. Yeah. So find him on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and grab his books on Amazon. They're all great. I haven't read Fire in the Dark yet. I'm going to grab it at some point. Um, do, you have an, do you have an audible version of it? Yes. And you narrated yes. it again? Yep. Always. Very good. I'm looking forward to listening to that one. So guys, follow Jack, check out his stuff. He's an awesome dude. And uh, we'll see you guys very soon in the next broadcast. Have an awesome one.